Hello, everyone. Welcome to welcome to the Christian Business Luncheon. Any first-time visitors today? Would you raise your hand? Awesome. We got a lot of first-timers. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Pastors. I know I've met a couple of pastors today. Would you raise your hand, please? Very good. One over here. Well, I am one. Sal's here. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for the work you do. We really appreciate it. Uh, and for those pastors that, that uh, haven't been here before, uh, every uh, October our luncheon is dedicated to pastors. It's the Pastors Appreciation Luncheon. We invite pastors from Tom Ball and surrounding areas to come and uh, with their spouses or guests, and uh, we, we honor them for the work they do. Okay. Um, I am going to uh, introduce someone I've been wanting to introduce for a long time, ever since we spoke a few months back, and uh, at Jim Van Steenhouse. Uh, Jim is the founder and CEO of Interlink Mortgage Services, one of Houston's most successful mortgage companies, and uh, they, they are focused on helping families realize the American dream of owning a home. And, uh, he and his wife Elizabeth created the Interlink Family Foundation, which supports organizations throughout the country to provide underprivileged and challenged youth with a sense of hope and belonging while helping them realize their God-given potential. That's just a great organization, great work that you all do. Um, so when he was uh, a kid, he started hunting as a pastime, and then it became a passion. Uh, he's hunted all over North America, Africa, New Zealand, and back in 2015, he was on a hunt up in northern Canada, a, a, a bow hunt for moose, when he was attacked by a grizzly bear. Uh, by all rights, he shouldn't even be here today, but uh, God has a plan for him, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing that, uh, hearing that plan in a few minutes here. Uh, Jim has been married to his wife, Elizabeth. Raise your hand, Elizabeth. Or Liz, I guess you go by Liz. Yeah, for, for almost 13 years. They have three kids, Dawson, Brianna, and Hayden, and uh, they live in Cyprus and attend Youth Global Church. Their pastor is with them today, Sal. Uh, and so, a little different today, uh, Jim's probably going to go to 115 today, uh, which is a little longer than we normally go, so if anybody has to leave back to work, he, he will definitely understand. And it's my pleasure to give Jim Van Steenhouse, the Bear Man. Thank you, boss. All right, maybe turn me down just a little bit in the back. I would like to, this is incredible for me, uh, having my wife here. During, during this uh, today adds a little bit of pressure. She usually doesn't have the opportunity to come. Uh, so if you see me acting kind of squirrely, that's why she just puts too much pressure on me. But I love her to death. She's an intricate part of this, of this story, and you'll find out why, why here, here, here in a minute. But I want to appreciate you guys inviting me out here today. It's an honor. I'm a businessman um, in this community. I get it. Um, it's a great, great opportunity. I think the economy is good for us, and I'm just really glad you guys invited me here. So the year was 2012. I was on an archery hunt brown bear on the Alaskan Peninsula. When you archery hunt for brown bear on the Alaskan Peninsula, it's all spot and stalk, meaning that you get there, it's a 22-day hunt, primarily because of the fact the Alaskan weather on the peninsula gets so bad that you'll be locked down in your tent for five or six, seven of those days, intermittent throughout the time that you're there. You'll get wind speeds up to 60 to 80 miles an hour you're there with your guide. On this particular hunt, my guide's name was Cody, and we were there for a 10-foot brown bear. On about the seventh day of the hunt, we spotted a beautiful brown bear. Probably two or three miles away, we started slithering through the wilderness there. And one thing about the Alaskan Peninsula, it rains all the time. It's windy all the time. As we slithered close to this bear, we got about 115 yards. She was down on a creek bed there, fattening up for the fall, getting their fill of salmon. If he took a right on that stream, we lost him. If he took a left, we'd have a chance. He'd be 43 yards in front of me at that stream with the wind blowing about 30, 35 miles an hour. I'd have a shot. We practiced it a thousand times in my backyard. That bear did hang a left, but instead of turning left and coming down that stream, he turned and he started walking straight towards me and Cody. At 120 yards, it was no big deal. At 100, it got a little bit hairy. At 50, then 40, then 30, then 20, then 10. Then at five yards, the only thing separating us and a 10-foot brown bear is an alder bush. 
And an alder bush in September has no leaves. So you're staring straight at this brown bear through the alder brush, and you can see the moisture on its face. And Cody is to my right. I'm left-handed. I've got my back to him. I'm on my knees. I got my bow here. The, br the bush is right here. And I see Cody's got a big, he's got a big rifle. He's got a video, hand in one, video recorder in one hand and a rifle in the other. And I see out of the corner of my eye, he just slides that rifle straight towards that bear's face. And I heard the safety go, click. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, it's on now. And that bear just instinctively took a little right turn, walked right in front of me at 11 yards. At 11 yards, you should be able to put an arrow through a lifesaver. I went to full draw, hit the bear, he spun, he went across the creek, 42 yards. Cody said, put another one in him. I went to full draw. I hit him again. I hit him right in the neck. I wasn't aiming for the neck. I just, the wind drifted it, and I hit him right in the neck, and I never saw that bear again. We believe firmly, Cody's got it on film, that the bear's dead. But out there in the wilderness, it was getting dark. We followed a little bit of blood. We had to camp out for the night, come back the next day. It rained all night long. We lost the blood trail. And for the next seven days, all we did was circle. All we did was circle. These hunts are booked two to three years in advance. You save for years to go on these hunts. And you practice and you get in shape. One thing about the mountains, the mountains don't care if you're in shape, but you do. And you're there for 22 days. That happened on about the seventh day of the hunt. So you've got another 14, 15 days to sit there and think about it. So we put ourselves in that situation and say, we're all business. Either, we either work for a great company, maybe you own a great company, maybe you're in between jobs. Maybe things that you work so hard to have happen just don't work out. Maybe all the things that you prepared for, you, you worked for months for this promotion, maybe you were overlooked. Maybe you've worked so hard at home, maybe you're having some issues with your spouse and it's just not coming together. What are you going to do? You're going to quit, you're going to keep going, you're going to complain. Here's one thing about complaining that we've got to make an agreement on today. There is no more complaining from this group of individuals. Let me tell you why. When you complain to somebody, 20% 20, 20 of the people are really glad it's your problem and not theirs. And 80% don't care that you have a problem. 20% want the problem to be yours, and 80% don't care about your problems. There isn't anybody you're going to tell a problem to that really cares about your problem. They have their own problems. So as you're going through life and things don't work out, man, you got to get up, you got to dust yourself off, and you got to get back after it. Make sense? All right, so on this particular hunt, I was after moose. I'm up in the Northwest Territories of Canada, and for those of us who are a little geographically challenged, I brought a map here. <laughs> Houston, Edmonton, Edmonton, Yellowknife, Yellowknife, Norman Wells. As you go north, the cities get smaller and smaller. In Norman Wells, you jump on a float plane. I don't know if any of you have been on a float plane before, but the reason it's called a float plane is it takes off and lands on water. They took off out of Norman Wells on a float plane, headed south west into the McKinsey mountain range. We were in the air for about two hours and 45 minutes, and that pilot landed that aircraft on a lake about the size of a football field. I was in that aircraft with six other hunters. They were all rifled. I was the only archer. And when you pull into base camp, you got a lot of things going on. Number one, you've got seven really amped up hunters. You've got seven really amped up guides meeting their hunters. Then you've got the owner who takes each hunter and their guide in a helicopter out into the wilderness and drops you off anywhere from five to 15 days. You just need to be prepared. So when you get there, you gotta do three things. Number one, you gotta get food and rations. Number two, you need to sight in your rifle, or for me, throw a couple arrows downrange. And number three, you gotta listen for your name to be called on the helicopter, because when your name is called, you either get on the helicopter, you go to the back of the list, and you don't get delivered until that night, or possibly the next day. My guide's name was Jordan. We walked into this big, huge metal silo that held all the food. He said, what kind of food do you want to have, Mr. Van Steen? I said, Jordan, you pick out the food. I'm going to save some time. I'm going to throw some arrows. I trust your opinion. Just get some carbs and some proteins. We'll call it good. He's like, that's fantastic. For carbs, I like ramen noodles. And for proteins, I like sardines. I'll take, I can't do sardines, Jordan. You're <laughs> We're going to skip the sardines. What's your second alternative? He says, we got tuna fish. I said, great, you go sardines, I'll go tuna fish. I'm going to throw a couple arrows. As time passed, my name was called. We jumped on the helicopter, and we're gone. When we landed that helicopter, 
on, the, on, the, on a sandy river stream. I remember the helicopter's taking off, and I'm looking down. We've got all of our gear around. I'm looking down. I'm looking at this paw print. And I said to Jordan, Jordan, is that a grizzly bear? And he said, yes, sir. We're going to stay away from those. You know, it's interesting. One of my favorite quotes by Gordon Hinckley. What happens to us today to be, that happens to be a sacrifice would, would, would prove to be our greatest investment. And if you think about it, throughout your childhood, college, maybe your MBA, your career, an accident, any setback that you've had, you have peaks and you have valleys in life. Very rarely do we learn the tough edges of the game up on top of the mountain. Where we learn the tough edges of the game and where we learn how to survive is down in the valley, when it's dark and nobody's got your back, and when you're calling your friends and they don't answer because they, quite frankly, don't want to join you down in the valley and you feel like you're all on your own. Had I not been attacked by this grizzly bear, I would not have had the opportunity to meet with you guys today. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to travel all over the country talking about my testimony and what this attack has means to me and how it has changed my life. So we can't fear going into the valleys. We gotta, I'm not saying we got to look forward to tough times, but one of the things that I can assure you, it's like going to the gym. You go to the gym one day, you get home, you look in the mirror, you look exactly the same. You're like, man, that's, I hate going to the gym. Two days, three days, four days, 30, you look in the mirror and you're like, mm, I might see something. Honey, you see anything? No, I don't see anything. You look exactly the same as you did 30 days ago. Great, thanks for the compliment. 60 days later, you see a change. 90 days later, but it all started back there. When I go hunting, I say goodbye to my family. I've got my beautiful bride. I've got two sons. I've got a daughter. And on this particular day, before I was leaving, she walked up to me and she said, Dad, you're in luck. The pedicure store is open. I sat down at the kitchen table like any man would proudly do with his daughter, and she painted my toenails burnt orange. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to the Northwest Territories of Canada. Who is ever going to see my toenails? <laughs> There's a picture of the McKinsey Mountain Range. That's from the float plane. Call that the McKinsey Mountain Hyatt. Now that, that tent is as small as it looks. It's about the size of your tabletop. Now you may say, well, there was two of you. There was you and there was Jordan. Where's Jordan's tent? That's both of ours. And if you take a look at the ground, the ground is very mossy. It's very squishy. It's when, you, you, when you walk, you sink down in it maybe six, seven inches. I'll tell you what, I go 250. Jordan goes maybe 180 wet. So when I'm heavier than he is, I sink at night. You know where Jordan wakes up the next morning. He's also my sous chef. We got up the very first morning, he cooked me ramen noodles for breakfast. I thought, this is fantastic. I hadn't had ramen noodles since I was in college. That lunch, he busts out a pack of ramen noodles. That night we got back to camp, he busts out a pack of ramen noodles. I was like, Jordan, what are you doing with the ramen noodles? He said, well, if you remember back at camp, you were too busy to pick out any foods. You told me to pick everything out. I happen to like ramen noodles. I was like, Roger that. <laughs> when you do these hunts, two things have to happen. You got to get used to the elevation. That's the toughest part because one step feels like 10, 10 feels like 20, walking uphill. You're down at, you're down at, the, at the river level, which you can see on this screen here. And you hike up anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 feet a day where you can glass, what they call spotting, all day to see if you can find some mature moose to get after. And one thing that I noticed, <clears throat> For those of you who, anybody in here else got a little attention deficit disorder, uh, uh, attention span of a lightning bolt, something like that, I realized that Jordan had grabbed 10 cans of tuna fish, four of which were pop top. The other six were traditional can opener. So I asked Jordan, I said, Mr. Jordan, four and six, do you have a can opener? Because after my fourth day, I'm out of tuna. He's like, no, I didn't bring a can opener. Did you bring a can opener? I'm like, of course I didn't bring a can opener from Houston, Texas. What are you talking about? He says, well, how many cans of tuna are you going to eat a day? I said, I'm going to have one a day, sir. He says, well, I don't have to worry about that to the fifth day, though, do I? <laughs> There's a picture of Jordan right there. <clears throat> On the second day of our hunt, we were watching a, a cow moose up in a draw. That's a female. We were hoping that a bull would come up towards her. It was that time of the season, it was mating season. And Jordan saw a grizzly bear about three and a half miles away above the tree line on one of the mountains. And he says, I'm gonna watch this, I'm gonna watch this cow and see if we get some bulls in here. We gotta keep our eyes on this grizzly bear. I want you to go spot to the north. I'll take care of this draw here. 
About an hour and a half later, he says, Man, Steenhouse, get over here, grab your bow. I wrote him running over there. I said, What you got? He says, That cow just come busting out of this draw, and I can't see that grizzly anymore. No sooner did he say that, up on the ridge we were on, that grizzly bear popped up. Now, Jordan was carrying a 44 lever action. It's not the biggest rifle you'd like to have out in that type of the territory. He said, if that bear comes any closer to us, I'm going to have to put one right in front of his face, see if I can scare him off. And no sooner did he say that, that bear took about three steps forward. Jordan put a bullet right in front of that bear's face. The dirt explodes. And that bear was enraged. And he went to charge. And when he went to charge, Jordan hit him right in the rib cage. That bear is probably 45, 46 yards away, and he goes barreling off that ledge we were on down into the willow brush. And here I am, all 240 pounds of me, with a bow and arrow in my hand, and I'm shaking like a leaf. And I looked over at Jordan, I said, I do not remember any one of those marketing brochures that you've been sending me for years to come hunt with this organization where you say I'm going to get eaten by a bear. And he says, we're going to stay away from those. Roger that. We went up and over a mountain on our third day. We went about five miles away from camp to get away from that grizzly bear that we had saw the day before. By now I'm on my third can of tuna, tuna, and Jordan is getting quite exasperated with me telling him that, you know, on my fourth can, we're plumb out of pop top, and we gotta figure out how you're gonna get a can open and get this thing open. We're gonna shoot it, we're gonna stomp on it, we're gonna get rocks. He's getting really, really, really frustrated with me. And one of the things I noticed, as you can see here in this picture, is my sat phone is down there by my feet. And when I, when, after glassing for a while, you get a little bit bored, and I realize that you can do a lot of things on these sat phones. I'm not one to read directions. Directions to me are when you buy a bicycle for your kids and you put it together at home, and there's many parts left over, that you just say those are the extra pieces that Academy gave me that I don't need, right? That's the extra pieces. I realize I could text message my wife, I realize that you can get your longitude and your latitude. You can do all types of amazing things on a satellite phone. As that day went on, the sun's starting to set, and Jordan's like, look, we got to get back. we got a five-mile walk. As we rounded the corner heading back to base camp, there he was, a giant, probably 50, 52-inch wide moose. He was down in the willow brush, and the stalk was on. Now the sun was setting, and we were racing darkness a little bit, and we had to push that moose. And we were at one point of that where Jordan says, I'm going to do a cow call, and that moose is going to come in. I want you to go stand behind this willow brush. I'm going to stand over here. He says, and by the way, when you stand over there, he says, Van Steenhouse, do not make any noise. If that moose sees you, he'll charge you, and he could kill you. I was like, man, roger that. We didn't get that moose. We had to push hard because the sun was setting. But it's not about the kill, it's about the chase. It's about, that's, that's the whole experience. And as we started to head back to camp that evening, my mind was racing, I was so excited. Everything that I wanted to do, I, we had just done it there. And it was, only, it was only our third day, I was pumped up. And all of a sudden, Jordan starts running, literally running. This is how we're dressed. This is not track gear. He starts running, and I grabbed him by the back of the neck, and I turned him around, I said, Jordan, what are you, what are you doing, man? We're five miles away from camp, why are you running? And he called me, looked at me, and says, Mr. Van Steenhouse, when the sun goes down, we are on the low side of the totem pole. And I said, Roger that. I had no problem running back to base camp. When we got up on the fourth day, it was freezing. It was so cold that I had a, I had a water bottle inside of a sock, inside of my boot that froze. I didn't sleep all night. I just stared at the ceiling of that tent. I was so excited to get up and go hunting the next day. I just could just envisioning that moose that I had saw the night before. We got up. It was freezing. I literally put on every piece of clothing that I owned, all of it. And I looked I look like the Michelin man walking up that mountain that day. We, we probably climbed up 1,500 feet. We got to this ledge, and Jordan's like, look, we got another 500 feet to get to the top of this of this draw I want to get on. Let's leave all of our gear here. You take your bow. I'll take my rifle. Drop all the backpacks. We'll be right back. I said, man, no problem. Shed all of our gear. Went up on top. About a couple hours later, sitting there glassing. And if you ever use your binoculars and you glass downhill for a while, sometimes I get a little bit nauseous. 
And then it occurred to me, Jordan's sitting to my left and I'm sitting here glassing it. It hit me like a light bulb. I put my glasses down. I said, Jordan, do you realize that today is my last day of pop top tuna? <laughs> and Jordan, by this time, you know, he, he's, he's completely exasperated with me asking. He's got his binoculars up and he just throws them down. And he looks at me and he said one word. He said bear. You know, there's a saying that if you don't run into the devil from time to time, you may have to question if you're running in the same direction. Because one thing I can assure you is the harder you pursue Christ and the more the Holy Spirit works through you to deliver the message, the harder the devil will come at you. We are but a piece of wire. That's what we are. We're a piece of wire. God will get His message out. It's coming. It will get out. The question is, who's going to deliver the message? The Lord's going to have the individuals deliver the message that delivers His message, not the person's message. They don't make it about them. They make it about God. We are the wire. And we want the Holy Spirit to work through us to deliver His Word. And the more you do that, and the more you put yourself in that position, He's coming. The devil does not want you talking to anybody about their faith that doesn't know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will come hard. But if he doesn't come at you, that's a fantastic quote. Before I tell you what happened when Jordan said bear, I want to give you an example of a bear's speed and agility. See, we're used to seeing bears on the Nature Channel or the Outdoor Channel National Geographic, or at the zoo. But bears in the wild, they act differently. See, they don't have the mental capacity when they are hunting prey to determine whether or not this prey requires 100%, this prey requires 50 or I only have to exert 20% for this prey. It's 100% all the time or nothing. 100% all the time or nothing. What we have here is a video of two black bears fighting. And I want you to pay attention to the lower right-hand part of the screen. That's the way that bears attack. Draw your attention to the lower right-hand side of the screen. Right now. That's the speed that they attack. I'll play one more time. Lower right-hand side of the screen. That's the speed that they move. They don't play. When you are the target, there is no play. And if you want to know about a grizzly bear in the Northwest Territories of Canada, well, there you go. That's a paw. Grizzly bears in the Northwest Territory are protected species. They have no fear. They're not hunted. They're a spiritual animal, the Inuits, the Eskimos. So they do not have fear of man. A grizzly bear smells 2,100 times better than a human. They can have top speeds of 35 to 38, 39 miles an hour for short bursts. They bite with 8 million pascals. That's a unit of measurement that is enough to crush a bowling ball. And in the Northwest Territories of Canada, they can weigh upwards of 1,200 pounds. When Jordan looked at me and he said bear, he was to my left. I just kind of, I, I, I just looked at him and he was looking straight through me and I looked over my right shoulder and the bear was standing about right at my 330. He was on all fours. Head was bobbing back and forth. Just made a deep grunt sound, just like a hur, hur. Lips were curling, and he would chomp his teeth. Now I looked back at Jordan. He was carrying that 44 lever action. I was in the line of fire. Had he shouldered that smoke wagon, I would have just laid back and let him roll thunder. And when I looked back at Jordan, he was in the exact same spot. When I looked back at that bear, he was on me. 
I just instinctively rolled my shoulder and I put my hands over my head, which is the first thing that he went for. When you have something break into your skull, you don't hear that externally, you hear that internally. And I could hear internally his teeth raking into my head and then I could hear externally as my hands went up into his mouth and he would just break in your fingers like they were twigs. He hit my right shoulder, my right side, left side, right hip, left thigh. And when that bear hit me, people always ask me, what, what do you remember about that bear? And the, I don't remember a lot about the attack. <clears throat> but I remember when he hit me, thinking, Lord, here I come, please have me. There are certain things that happen in our lives that when they do happen, and I hope you're never in that situation where you just know you're not going to survive. That was one of them. I knew that there was no way I was going to survive that attack when he hit me. And I said, Lord, here I come. I thought about my wife, my daughter, my family, and the fact that you're just not coming home. He dragged me over 50 yards, 150 feet. You see, Jordan, my guide, when that bear hit me, I'm sitting three feet from Jordan, and that bear attacks me. Jordan's in his 20s, you, you saw a picture of him. The bear's dragging me down the, down the mountain. Jordan stands up, and he starts walking that bear down the mountain with that 44. Racks one in, shoots left, shoots right, shoots left. And as he would tell me several months later when I invited him to Houston for saving my life, he apologized. He said, Jim, I'm sorry, but I had to shoot the bear while he was on you. I was like, man, you don't got to apologize for that. <laughs> he said, I was getting so aggressive, we're trained to shoot left and right. We're trained not to shoot the, the animal because it could hit a bone and ricochet. But it was getting so aggressive, I had, to, I had to lay one right inside of me. And you ask yourself, would, would, would you do that if you were Jordan? You know, we all say we're brave. It's like Mike Tyson says, everybody's tough till they get hit in the mouth. But Jordan stood up and he's walking that bear down the mountain with a 44 lever action. That bear could have turned on him in a heartbeat and been on him in a New York second and killed him. But he got up and he walked it down. I mean, to me, that's heroic because we never know how we would act until we are actually in that situation. We can think in our minds how we would act. But until you are actually faced with that type of circumstance, you will never know how you will act. And he acted in a way that I'm not sure that I would act. And you know what? I wouldn't have blamed him had he not gone after the bear. He's got a life to live himself. But that's not the way he acted. As I was laying on the ground, I could see the bear step off me to my left. And I just got my face firmly planted against the ground as hard as I can push it. And I could see him, he'd take a step, and he'd just look back at me, just a blank stare. One thing about that bear, I'll never forget the sound that he made, the growl, and he smelled like death. And he would take another step, and he would look back. And as I laid there on the ground, I'm looking around. I had no idea where I was. You see, when I started, I was up on a ridge. Now I'm almost into the pine trees. And I knew I had to been dragged downhill. And as I'm looking around, I thought it was raining outside, and I went to wipe my face with my hands. I looked at my hands, and my fingers are going in directions that I never thought that I would ever see fingers go. And I was like, oh! So I went to wipe my, hand, my face with my left hand, and it was the same thing. So I went to wipe my face with my forearm, and I realized it wasn't raining, that wasn't water, it was blood. I got to my knees, I just started crawling up the mountain. I was yelling Jordan's name. I needed to ask Jordan, is, what, is my head okay? I didn't know if the top was missing, cut open, I was afraid to touch it, I couldn't feel it anyways, my hands were all messed up. And as I'm starting to stumble up the mountain, I see Jordan coming down at me. He's screaming my name. I'm screaming his name. And as we get right up to each other, I was about ready to ask him, is my head okay? And he looks at me and he goes, holy. Mm. And then I was afraid. 
You see, we had left our backpacks on the other side of that ridge because we were going to be right back. We not only had to go back up where the dra bear had dragged me, but we had to go back down another 500 feet to the backpacks. That's where my medical kit was. That's where, that's where everything was. See, Jordan used what's called a, an in-touch or an in-reach system. Every day it's a little device on the mountain, connect to a satellite, back to base camp. Every morning, every afternoon, every evening, he would check in, test it all the time, because base camp needs to make sure that the hunter and the guides are okay. Tested it, tested it, tested it all the time. He grabbed it out of his backpack, fired it up, and I just remember him throwing it against the ground. He's like, man, it's not working. And I don't know if it was the Indian or the arrow. It doesn't matter. But I remember laying against my backpack and telling Jordan, I says, look, grab my satellite phone. It's in my backpack. There's a red button on top of that satellite phone. I said, I never read the directions, but what I hear is that if you push that button, the Navy SEALs will come. So Jordan fires up the satellite phone, hits the red button. And about 30 seconds later, he got a text message. It said, Dear Iridium user, in order to use the SOS feature, you must first pre-register your phone. It's a free service, but mandatory prior to it functioning properly. <clears throat> I said, Jordan, you're going to have to call my wife, who's sitting right there. From the mountain and the McKinsey's, in the Northwest Territories of Canada, he called my wife from this phone, and she was in the parking lot at Kroger's. He said, Miss Van Steenhouse, my name is Jordan Wagner. Your husband has been attacked by a grizzly bear. And then the phone went dead. See, the emergency system actually does work. They took her out. They plugged themselves in. Now, she went dormant for quite some time. That's a whole other story. But then it was about evacuation. You see, the Coast Guard couldn't get into us because the ceiling was too low. So they had to work backwards to get to our base camp. And they finally got a hold of Stan. He's the gentleman that owns it that runs the helicopters. And they said, Stan, look, we can't get the Coast Guard out. You're going to have to go get this guy off that mountain. Here's the longitude and latitude. Good luck. Now, if I give you the longitude and latitude and tell you to go find somebody in the mountains, it's a lot different than somebody pinging you from a sat phone. You feel like a needle in a haystack. We could hear that helicopter coming, and it'd fly past us, down, down the valley, it'd fly in front of us, it'd fly around the mountain around, and Jordan is frantically standing there on the mountain, waving a burlap sack. And I'll never forget, I heard that chopper come around down in the canyon below us. It's probably out there 100, 150 yards below us and it just rises up right in front of us. And I am literally staring right into the eyes of Stan the pilot. And he takes that chopper and he lands it right on that ridge we were on. Now a gentleman had shot a moose on the second day. His name was Dr. Bob Burlingame, one of the most amazing men that I've ever had the opportunity to meet. He jumped off that helicopter, and one thing about doctors is you kind of make fun of all the equipment they always take everywhere until you really need it. Then I was really appreciative that he took all that equipment from Houston up to <laughs> Northwest Territories. And I remember he came over, I'm laying on the backpack, and he's asking me all kinds of questions, and I'm answering his questions, we're having a conversation. But one thing about being in shock is when you're in shock, you don't know you're in shock. He's asking me questions, I'm answering his questions, and he looks at the, at, at the guys that were standing there, he's like, he says, they're, he's completely non-responsive. And the next thing I know, I'm, on, I'm laid out on these backpacks, and they stick me in the back of this helicopter, and they go back to base camp. Now I'm laying in the back of the helicopter, I can feel the blood running down my back. I'm looking at my hands, they put some plywood underneath of my hands that they broke with their feet and put some tape on it. And it looks like I had just gotten in a fight with Edward Scissor's hands. And all of a sudden I remember Bob and the guys are over in this, they're over in this having like this man huddle over there. I can see them out the chopper windows and they're talking, and you know, men they're talking with their arms and doing all this stuff. And they walk over to the chopper and they just start taking stuff out of the chopper. Taking stuff out of the inside, taking stuff out of the outside, throwing it in a pile. 
And Stan gets in, and Bob gets in, and Stan looks over at Bob, and he says, Bob, i got to get him to Norman Wells. You're not going to be able to make this trip. Now let me kind of put in perspective for you the helicopter that we are on. This is, uh, uh, this is not the Trump chopper. This is the Magnum PI chopper. Okay, we all got that in our heads. He says, this helicopter is not meant to go the distances that we're going. I'm praying that the two of us will make it. I'm not sure that the three of us will. Bob Burlingame got out of that chopper. And again, somebody else, putting somebody else's life in front of their own, picked up that helicopter to take me to Norman Wells. As I'm in the back of that helicopter, I'm looking out those windows. I showed you some pictures earlier of the mountains. And I can feel the blood rushing down, and I'm, 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 I'm freezing, and I'm, I'm tired. And you're just kind of drifting in and out. And everything that I see outside of those windows just looks like it just wants to rip me apart. And I ask myself a very important question. If I were to die right here in the back of this helicopter, on this chair, am I going to heaven? Close your eyes for a second. Put yourself in the back of that helicopter with me. You have no idea if you're going to make it to Norman Wells. You have no idea of the injuries that you've sustained outside of the fact that everything you look at is, doesn't look the way it used to. Blood is everywhere. And I panicked. <clears throat> I remember freezing in the back of that helicopter, looking out those windows, and I was stricken, stricken with fear. The devil just wrapped me up <clears throat> in a tap-out hold, hold. He just pretzled me right there in the back of the helicopter. Then I felt the Holy Spirit. Son, you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When my son was crucified on the cross, he forgave every sin that you've ever committed, any, every sin that you will commit today, and every sin that you will commit in the future. And his commitment to you on the forgiveness of sins, they are forgiven as far as the east is from the west. By inviting him into your heart as your Lord and Savior, you have your opportunity to go to heaven. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son who was crucified on that cross for us. And when we put ourselves in that vulnerable position, it's like the 99 and the 1. Jesus Christ is on the cross with the two thieves. One of those thieves has probably been a thief all of his life. I don't have his bio, but if it read like a rap sheet, it was probably pretty long. And he accepted the Lord and Savior on that cross, and he went to heaven. His compadre, not so smart. It doesn't matter how cloudy our past is. It doesn't matter how long your debit sheet is. It doesn't matter how long your credit sheet is. We will have an account when we get to heaven. Let there be no mistake about that. But when the angel opens up my debit sheet, the angel's not going to be able to open up my debit sheet and just go like this, let's talk about this. My debit sheet will hit the ground and it'll roll halfway across the room. That's how big my debit sheet is. And I'm not happy about that but I own it. My name is on every single one of those sinful acts. And I can't take them back. I can't put the genie in the bottle. I can't unhurt people. But Jesus forgave those sins. And I'm going to work on my credit sheet. And every day I add to my debit sheet. I hate it when I do it, but man, I do it. And I ask for forgiveness, but I try to just add a cheat, put another one on the credit sheet. When I felt the Lord and Savior come over me on the back of that helicopter, it was as if I had just walked inside on a February morning, minus 20 degrees, and my wife just put a blanket around my shoulders in front of the fire. I went from cold to warm, and when I looked out those windows, I saw nothing 
but our Lord's majestic beauty. See, we did make it to Norman Wells. We did make it out of those mountains. But here's the deal. When you accept the Lord as your Savior, He will promise you a safe landing. It doesn't say anything about calm passage. You read the Bible and find one individual that chased the Lord with all of their heart and at the end says, that was easy. It's not. Because when you chase the Lord, the devil's chasing you. You will have a calm passage. That may not be on this planet. It may be in heaven. Maybe you will have calm passage on this planet. I don't know the answer. But you will not. <laughs> you won't have so calm passage. You will have a safe landing. We did make it to Norman Wells. We came out of those mountains. We come up to the airport. This is funny. I was just there four days ago. We landed on a commercial airliner. And we pull out in the helicopter. And I'm looking out the windows. And I'm looking at, man, there's ambulances on. There's fire trucks and police cars. There's, they're, they're everywhere on the runway. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what a bad day. A plane must have crashed as well. And we come pulling out of there, and they landed that helicopter right in the middle of that runway. See, Norman Wells doesn't have a, a doctor's office. They have a nursing station. They don't have a hospital. The hospital is two and a half hours away in Yellowknife. So I'm in the hospital. The nurses are on the phone with the surgeons in Yellowknife talking back and forth. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police are trying to ask me questions. It's a disaster in that room, man. There's a lot of things going on. That's a picture when they first started cleaning me up. You can see that's a couple where the canines went into my skull. That's right here on my shoulder. Just missed miss, just miss puncturing my, my bronchial artery. Had that hit, I would have bled out. I would not be here today. There's a picture of my back. You can completely see the mouth indention on my side there, and there's a dark purple spot right in the middle of my back. That just barely, barely missed puncturing my lung. Had that hit, I would not be here today. Interesting thing about these photographs, these are actually taken in my bathroom some 50 to 60 days after the accident. So that's when your body has a couple months to heal. Left side. That it's about seven and a half inches long, an inch and a half wide, and three inches deep. Seven and a half inches long, inch and a half wide, about three inches deep. When we say bears don't play, they don't play. Broke both my hands in multiple places. Canada had to send a medevac jet to take me to Yellowknife. Nicest plane I've ever been on, and Canada will send you a $21,000 bill for using it. <coughs> I was in surgery for six and a half hours. The accident happened at 10 o'clock in the morning. I went into surgery at 9.30 at night. It came out close to 4 o'clock in the morning. I was awake the whole time. They had you on morphine. Had two doctors working on my head and staples, head, stitches, nurses all over the place. I remember one nurse was in the back of the room reading off grizzly facts. Hey, did you know if you check Google, 99.9% .9 of the people that get attacked by grizzly in Northwest Territories don't survive? Oh, sorry, Jim, I hope that doesn't bother you. <clears throat> and I remember when she was adjusting, when she was adjusting the, the blankets on my bed, she picks them up, and she's like, your toes are orange. And I said, I can explain that. <laughs> I had 50-some staples in my head. I had more stitches than you could count. As I showed you, my hands were broken in multiple places. And they stick me in this room with a guy named Dean Manderville. And we are separated by a curtain. Now, Dean Manderville is in the hospital because his bowels are blocked. I would almost rather be attacked by a grizzly bear than have my bowels blocked. Now, they had to use antibiotics to get that undone, or they were going to have to have surgery. Dean was not in a very good mood. Dean, when his bowels worked perfectly, sometimes would not be in a very good mood. It reminded me of Walter Matthau, right, in those movies. And I'm laying in bed one night, and I felt the Holy Spirit come over me and say, go pray for Dean. I have never gotten out of bed and prayed for somebody. 
ever. I've never walked up to somebody at church and said, I've been thinking about you, can I pray for you? I've never stood in front of anybody and told anybody about my faith. Ever. And now I felt the Holy Spirit say, go out of bed and go pray for Dean. I ignored it. And I laid there. I could hear Dean over on his side of the curtain listen to the Toronto Blue Jays baseball game. And I just laid in bed. I'm all hooked up to this machine. Got the standard issue blue gown on that's 99% open in the back. And I felt the Holy Spirit get out of bed and go pray for Dean. I ignored it again. The third time, get out of bed and go pray for Dean. I swung my feet over to the side of my bed. I had, my feet had not touched the ground in that hospital yet. I got all these cords and tubes going to this tree thing. I can't grab it with my hands because they're in soft cast, so I put it in my elbow. And I shuffle out of my curtain over to Dean's curtain. And I said, Dean, may I come in? He's like, what? I said, may I come in? On the other side of the curtain, I hear a whatever. So I bump open that curtain, and I took a step inside. He's watching the Toronto Blue Jays game. I'm standing at the foot of his bed. I said, Dean, can I pray for you? Turns that television down, looks at me and goes, what? I said, can I pray with you? He says, whatever. I couldn't grab his hands. I shuffled over and I put my hands on top of his. And we prayed. As I turned around to walk out, he said, hey, bear man. I said, yeah. He said, that's the first time anybody's prayed for me like that before. Now the next morning, I'm laying in bed and the hospital guy comes up with the serving table. And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I, I got to have sugar. I'm a sugarholic. And I asked him, I'm like, man, y'all got any candy bars here? <laughs> he says, yeah, man, the vending machine's down on the first floor. Get out of the elevator, tank right. And I was like, dude, man, I got nothing. He looks at me, he's like, yeah, you're right. I'll see what I can do. And he walks out. About an hour and a half later, he comes back and he's like, Snicker, Milky Way, Reese's, doom, ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. I'm like, man, I'll never be able to repay you. He says, you don't owe me anything. You're the bear man. That's how the name came about. When I left that hospital, my brother flew up to get me. Put me in that wheelchair and as he's wheeling me out, I heard Dean say, hey, bear man. I was like, yeah. I turned around. He was there with his wife. She was very pregnant. Michael wheeled me over on his side of the curtain. He said, I prayed for you last night. There's a picture of Dean. They had that little baby. His name's Michael. You know, I don't know what Dean's walk with faith is. Every time I talk, I send Dean a text message. We've had 15 bear man testimonies as of this June. So 15 times I'm dripping on my brother Dean. Because I believe that when I get to heaven, two things are going to happen. Number one, I'm going to open up my eyes and I'm going to see this giant grizzly bear. And Jesus is going to pull the head back and he's going to say, I got your attention, didn't I? Now that I have your attention, allow me to introduce you to all of the individuals that I work through you, that you introduced to me as their Lord and Savior. And my seed was planted. And it was planted on fertile ground. And I'm going to get to meet everybody that I've had the chance over the last three and a half years to speak with someday when I get to heaven. That's a, uh, I couldn't pass that shirt up. It's a bear chasing a stick man. It's called Canadian fast food. <laughs> that was me. And they got another one where a bear's dragging a stick man out of a tent. That's called Canadian takeout. <laughs> Here's my challenge to us today. I don't know how many people we got in this room. 50, 60 people. If we could all live our life in such a way that when our feet hit the floor every day, Satan shuddered and said, oh hell, he's awake, or oh hell, she's awake. 
Imagine the lives we could change. Imagine there's 364 days in a year. Imagine if every day that you got up, you said, I'm going to talk to somebody about our Lord and Savior today. Just one person. If you're not shy, talk to two or three. Somebody, do the math, if 50 people say, I'm going to get out of bed every day of the year and I'm going to talk to one person about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, how many people we would touch? We have the ability to make the decisions, to live our life in such a way that the devil doesn't even want you to get out of bed. He's going to make it rain outside. He's going to do everything in his power to stop you. One person a day to talk to him about our Savior. One. Think of that effect, the ripple effect, the butterfly effect, whatever effect you want to call it. And just think of those, if that one person that we touch, if that seed is on fertile ground and it grows spiritual roots and they talk to somebody, the impact we could have in this group is thousands of people on an annual basis. That's a wound vac that I'm wearing there. I had to wear that around. That heals wounds from the outside in instead of the inside out when they're really deep. And those that walk in pride, he is able to humble. You don't have to be like me. The Lord will chase you. He wants every single one of you. And he will humble you. Do not be like me and have to be attacked by an 850-pound grizzly bear for the Lord to get your attention. I can tell by looking at you, you are a lot smarter than I am. But he will pursue you. Romans 5, 3 through 5, one of my favorite scriptures. Endurance, character, problems, endurance. Your problems create endurance. The more problems you have, the more you get used to problems, you build up your endurance. It's kind of like running. If we all got outside and we ran one mile today, we'd come back here, we probably wouldn't feel very good. But if we all ran one mile a day for 30 days, the first five days, six days, it'd be a real problem. But on day 25, 26, and 27, we'd be walking back into the room saying, man, I think I might run two miles tomorrow. Our problems will create endurance. And then your endurance will create character. Your character is when you walk out the door and we walk out the door to go run a mile that I know I'm going to beat you and you're like, not today, son, I'm going to take you down. That's your character. You walk in with a little bit of swagger. You're living your life right. Your problems, endurance, endurance, character. When you have character... The Lord will fill you with hope. You will not wake up any day of your life filled with hope and feel like complaining. It's not possible. If you're one of those people that wakes up and it's woe is me and everything is a problem, remember what I said. 20% of the people are really glad it's your problem and 80% of the people don't care. Take those problems, create some endurance. Your endurance will create your character. Your character will create hope. And you will not wake up and get out of bed that way anymore. That's just the way it works. Anything you do for 30 days creates a habit. Try it. Little slide deck of the cards I got at home. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You know, faith is an interesting thing. Certain of what we hope for, sure of what we hope for, and certain of what we do not see. Faith can be a little confusing unless you read Matthew 17, 20. Because you can get real confused on this faith. Oh, I got faith. Well, then the going gets stuff, and you're like, hmm, oh, this faith, man. Where, where is it? I don't see it. But just read Matthew 17, 20. If you have faith the size of A, you can move. The Lord knows how hard it is. He knows. Faith is difficult. It is difficult that we can't get out of bed and put our hands on something tangible. That's tough. He knows the way we're wired. Man, he gets it. So how much faith do we have to have? A mustard seed. I grew up on a farm. I know the size of a mustard seed. You guys know the size of a mustard seed. And you can move this object that is immovable in our minds. That's faith. You know, there are seven hunters on that hunt. Six of them got moose. I did not. You know, here's a picture of my family. My beautiful bride, my two boys, my daughter. Therefore, be on alert, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. See, you think you know what you're doing this afternoon. 
Man, if you guys like in here, man, man, this dude needs to hurry up. It's two minutes after one o'clock and I gotta get back to work. Man, you think you got your whole day wrapped up. You see, I went to Canada to recharge my batteries. That's what I do. It's not you go somewhere hunting. It's not about the kill. It's about the pursuit. It's where you feel your battery recharged, like plugging in your cell phone. Some of you recharge socially. Some of you go read. My daughter goes to her bedroom and her dollies spring to life and she just has this, it's like the magic kingdom in her room, but you see her battery just do. I thought I was going on a hunt to recharge my batteries. You make plans for the future, which is fantastic. It's called goals. If it, what gets measured gets done, man, I understand it. But don't think for a second that I'm going to think about this God thing tomorrow. Or I'm going to maybe go to church this Sunday. I'm going to check. Man, think about it now. What if somebody paylaid you at the exit over here on the traffic light? Man, a little bit late then. Man, there's grizzly bears everywhere. The devil is everywhere. If, if the devil feels that you are taking steps towards Christ, he's going to get in your way. Because every single one of you has got a grizzly bear on your back. Some of you have work problems. Maybe somebody got overlooked for a promotion. Maybe somebody just got fired. Maybe somebody's got some relationship problems. Maybe, who knows? Maybe you just wrecked your car and there's not enough money in the bank to fix it. And somebody's teeth need to get fixed and the finances are just like, ha! Ah! We all got bears. We all got bears. Problems, endurance, endurance, character, character, hope. Face them. Be tough. Pray for the Lord. Invite them into your heart and say, man, I, I'm turning all this stuff over to you. You take it. I'm going to follow you. Try that. I'm going to leave you with five things today. I'm going to leave you with five things that you cannot recover. Number one, a stone after the throw. You can't unhurt someone. You cannot unhurt someone. As I told you earlier, my debit sheet goes to the back wall. I've hurt a lot of people in my life. I can say I'm sorry. But that doesn't take away the pain. Be mindful of the way we act when we think and when we speak. We cannot unhurt someone. The word after it's said. You know, in today's world, I say it's not only the word after it's said, it's the email after it's sent, it's the tweet after it's sent, it's the Facebook post after it's sent, it's the Instagram, it's the this, it's the that. When you're angry, there isn't anything good that you're going to type out and send somebody. When you are angry, there isn't a single person that's going to say, Mark is mad at me, I can't wait to get his email. Let it go. I have so many of those on my debit sheet. And when you hit the send button, you're like, yeah, don't. Oh, ah, and it's gone. The word after it's said. The occasion after it's missed. How many of us are such busy executives and they've got kids in uh, cheer or camp or Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, basketball, football, volleyball, but you're so busy. I can't make this game, Brianna, but I'll come to that next one. I can't make this one, Hayden, but I'll come to the next one. I was one of those people. You'll never get that time back. Ever. You think you control time, and you think you know what you're doing tomorrow. But I've got a challenge for every single one of us that have children. Show up. Be there. When I got attacked by that grizzly bear, I didn't spend a nanosecond thinking about my company. Not a nanosecond. There's 50 people in this room. Probably over 70% of us have children, some grandchildren. Make a point, write it down. Don't miss the occasions. Just don't do it. Because here's what happens. You can't get back time after it's gone. It's too late. It's like that old song, Little Boy Blue and the Man on the Moon. When are you coming home, son? I don't know when, but we'll have a good time then. 
I've got a 23-year-old son. I didn't spend a lot of time with him, and I can never get it back. And that's on my debit sheet. And that's on me. Now, he's probably forgiven me, but I'll never forgive myself for not being more involved in his life. And you never get that time back. But you know what? That's how we learn. We can't say, well, I screwed it up there. I got a couple more kids. I'm just going to keep acting that way. No, man, we got to change. We got to change now. Don't miss the time after it's gone. And lastly, do not wait for a relationship with Jesus Christ until six strong people carry you into a church. It's too late. The Bible is crystal clear, crystal, on how a man or a woman are granted access to heaven. You don't get confused when you read it. It's crystal clear. So maybe that seed's planted today. They're putting a little bit of dirt on it. Maybe you're thinking about going to church this Sunday. Man, what I'm going to leave with you today is just don't wait. Talk to someone about that. Talk with someone about that. I've enjoyed our time together today. Take care, guys. Bear man's out. Any questions, no. any questions for... Uh... Anybody want to ask any questions? Any questions on the attack? My best questions came from a group of third graders. I gave a, a talk to a bunch of third graders, and I'm up on the stage, right? And these third graders are in the chairs at this school, and their feet are dangling. They don't even hit the ground, right? And I'm up on the stage, and I'm like, do you guys like sitting in those chairs? They're like, no. I'm like, want to sit on the ground and just chit-chat about this? They're like, and we sat around, and they asked some of the best questions. Any questions? Did you say Cody got the bear, or did you find out? Cody shot the uh, Jordan was uh, the guide. Um, uh, when I was attacked. They shot the bear. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police went back out to look for the bear. Um, although, I mean, it's never been reported that they found it. I was actually, uh, the Canada puts out the top 10 news articles every week. I was, uh, for that week, I was number two. So, yeah, that's my claim to fame. The only time I've ever been in like top 10. Any other questions? Would you go hunting again? Absolutely. Um, look, I mean, it's like, it's like uh, how many people have been in an automobile accident? I mean, did you drive here today, right? <clears throat> it happens. You don't want it to happen, but it happens. And that's it's my passion. It's, it's, it's what I love to do in life. Yes is the answer to your question. I actually went back out into the McKin uh, on the western side of the McKinsey Mountain Range in 2000, September of 18, and I harvested a moose and I harvested a grizzly bear. So, so I call that the redemption tour. <laughs> yeah, good question. You know, uh, my, my oldest son hunted with me, um, and then he kind of fell out of love with that. My youngest, uh, Hayden, is 11, 11 and he hasn't, he hasn't gotten the bug yet. Um, my daughter has absolutely no respect for what it is that I enjoy doing. Um, <laughs> But uh, so it looks like I might be the last of the Mohicans when it comes to hunting in my family. I don't know yet. We'll see. Bow Sir? I actually started uh, going after my Grand Slam of sheep, and I'm doing that, uh, the, the sheep hunt, the North American Grand Slam, with a rifle. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Good question. Yes, sir? You know, look, here's the deal. I could, I could think all day why that accident happened and what happened as a result of it. But I'll tell you what I believe. I believe that I live my life in such a way that the only way the Lord was going to get my attention was he had to do it firmly. And if that kind of can, you can put in your mind what a slave to selfishness that I was, oftentimes still am. I'm still working on my debit sheet, but I want to start hitting my credit sheet. But I believe that was the Lord's way of chasing me, and he got my attention. I believe that the Lord saw in me what I didn't see in myself. See, he sees in you everything that you can do, but you can't see it yourself. 
How frustrating it will be when, if you get to heaven and the Lord says, man, fine job. What's your name? Michael. Michael. Michael, look, I am so proud of you, Michael. This is what you did in your life. This is what you could have done through me. But I mean, I'm proud of you, Michael. You did, you did a really good job with what you had. This is what I envisioned for you. So you end up here. You got one life. Somebody tell me if they believe differently. You get one shot. I'm 53 years old. I know where I'm at on the bell-shaped curve. I want to go to heaven. My number one goal is to have the Lord look at my debit sheet. He will shake his head. And he will look at my credit sheet. And he will look at me and he will say, you finished strong. Well done. Just finish strong. Finish strong. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Great question. I accepted the Lord and Savior when I was probably in middle school. I grew up in a family where going to church, <clears throat> you, you went to church. I grew up on a farm. My dad asked you asked questions one time. He didn't ask a second time. You didn't, well, you didn't want him to have to ask you the question a second time. Okay? <clears throat> and so going to church for me, I'm the kind of person, if you said, Jim, jump in front of that train. I'd be like, man, jump your own self in front of that train. But if you said, Jim, would you consider jumping in front of that train for me? I'll do it every day of the week and twice on Sunday. That's just the way that I'm wired. Don't tell me what to do. Ask me, ask me to help you. But I grew up in a family where I had to do this. And I resented it. And I went just the opposite way. If you told me that church was good, no, no. You can tell me to consider church and I consider it, but if I got to go to church and if I don't get out of bed on time, somebody's pouring water on my head, that's not the way that I get pumped up to go to church. So did I grow up in a spiritual family? I did. Did I resent the church? You bet I did. But I came back to it in my own way. And I'm really glad that the Lord saw things in me that I would have never seen myself. But he said, man, I'm really going to introduce you to these amazing people. And the Holy Spirit is going to work for you, through you. Unfortunately, I'm going to have you eaten by a grizzly bear. But just hang tight. <laughs> That's my life. Any other questions? All right, man. Have a great day, y'all. All right.